Before we get too deep into this interview, let's talk about the election real quick. Do you know how many seats the Democrats or the Republicans are going to win in the Senate? Well, put your money where your mouth is because there's finally a legal way to bet on the election. Special shout out to today's sponsor of this video, Kaushi. Kaushi is the first legal exchange where you can bet on any event, including but not limited to the election. If you are anything like me, you are always looking for ways to get skin in the game. Well, here's your chance. Download Kaushi now using my link, link in description, and if you are one of the first 500 people who sign up using my link, you will get a free $20 credit to play with. That, of course, is if you deposit $100. But if you're as confident as I am about Donald Trump winning, then that won't mean much to you at all. Let's get Trump back in the White House and let's get more money in your pocket. Now let's get back into the video. What's going on, guys? We have a special video here today. I've been wanting to do a podcast for so long. I've been looking for the perfect moment. Who do I bring on as the first guest? And then I stumbled across my good friend, Vim Miller. And uh, if you don't know his story, if you don't know what he's went through the last few weeks, we're about to get into that. But before we do, Vim, it's good to have you on the podcast. Great to be with you, brother. If, you, if they don't know who you are, will you go in a little bit of depth on what got you into politics, what got you started? Yeah, so um, I currently run this thing called the America Happens Network. We do 14 different shows with uh, Mindy Robinson. She's my business partner. And uh, really what got me into politics, I, w I grew up in Los Angeles. I was doing production since I was a kid. I mean, early 90s is when I started. I became a really uh, well-known music video director in the 2000s, then started selling TV shows around 2008, 2009, producing TV shows, executive producing, running development for different networks. And then around, uh, really what happened was I started to notice like the fake news. And I started to notice this really early on. And I'm talking about early 2000s. It was a reaction to the whole George W. Bush administration, yeah. the Patriot Act, all that stuff. And that's when I launched the first version of America Happens. And believe it or not, we went viral on MySpace at that time. I was MySpace? Speech, yeah, MySpace. I was, I was more of a Democrat at that time because my... First political experience was with George W. Bush, and I didn't like anything that he was doing, honestly, you know? And so that affected my politics. I, we launched Ameri the America Happens Network. We went viral on MySpace in 2007. I was featured on the Young Turks in 2007. And in 2008, I was one of these people that thought, you know, Barack Obama was going to save us from a lot of the bad policies yeah. of George Bush. And so I actually helped his campaign. And I have to admit, I did not know much about politics as much certainly as I know now. And so that left me very disappointed. Around 2015, I started to hear Donald Trump and what he was saying and his kind of bare knuckles approach to like saying the kind of things I felt like telling the Bushes, really. Like that's what it was. Like when he started going after the Jeb Bushes and these deep state people, I was like, whoa, I like this guy. But at the same time, I'm working in Hollywood and I'm noticing how they're manipulating the news. There's this trick that they do in reality shows called Frankenbiting, where they Frankenstein footage to create like a false version of yeah. reality. That's how reality shows are produced. And it's always fiction. It's There's nothing reality about reality shows. And take it from me, I've done, produced tons of them, sold tons of them, and it's fiction most of it and so when they start when they hired jeff zucker who was really a reality show producer and he's the kind of reality show producer that uh, excelled at creating conflict on camera like they literally go into one's life break up one's marriage get people like doing horrible kind of things in their life in order to create drama and i'm like whoa this is the guy that you're hiring to run cnn yeah. and i knew that was bad news and then that manifested itself to, to blood on the streets because they were creating so much conflict saying that orange man bad, you know, he's a racist, they're Nazis. And I'm like, dude, they're using news that they're supposed to be authentic. And really what they're doing is they're creating like division, you know, and Barack Obama, I start to realize was a tool of division. And so really the last few years of working in television as a producer was very difficult i saw the wokeism come i was working at vice media developing shows and producing shows show running shows at that time and um all of a sudden you know all the professionals were replaced by these purple purple haired people which by the way drove them to bankruptcy so you go woke yeah. you go broke you know and i was like this is not cool you know so around 2018, I left the business altogether, and I went 
and did something else for like two years. Mm -hmm. And then in 2000, I started relaunching the America Happens Network. In 2022, I ran for office as a Republican, got a lot of votes actually for a candidate that was not well known yeah. and running against two very well known candidates. I got about tw almost 22% of the vote. The winning margin was a little bit more than 31. And I had a lot- So you weren't far behind. No, and I had a lot less money than those guys because I was just aggressively knocking on yeah. doors. Because when I'm like de dedicated to something, like my hustle's crazy. It's oh, yeah. like, and, you know, I was like, I had this thing called campaign sidekick and campaign 360. I think that if you, people look at the evidence of what that was, 6,000, 10,000 doors I knocked on. And if I had a little bit more money, I actually think I could have won because I didn't do the postcard mailers mm -hmm. that the old people that's how you get their votes because they're yeah. not digital. They're not like a lot of time they don't open their doors when you knock on their doors because yeah, they're, they're scared of old people, you know. And so that kind of gave me a, a credibility because a lot of people that run for office, like first timers, get like 3% of the vote. Certain big names sometimes get like 1% mm -hmm. of the vote, like influencers and people that have been on the, yeah. on the news. I don't want to give any names. So then I started to focus after I ran for office pretty much on just producing content for the America Happens Network, building our lineup with the vision being that we're essentially creating this uh, new, uh, for, for the new America that's coming, which is hopefully the constitutional America that's mm -hmm. coming, producing content that really kind of approaches things from, a, things from a 360 way, meaning we have our podcasts, we have our documentaries, we also have medi medical shows that talk about the stuff that the mainstream media won't talk about because mm -hmm. they're so much, fi they're financed by pharmaceutical companies. So the idea was to re really build like the next level network that does all the things that the old networks don't yeah. do. Like we just launched another thing called HN News Live, which, oh, sorry, HN Music Top 5 Countdown, which is basically TRL, mm -hmm. but without all the negative, promiscuous, drug-infused, some people would say, you know, even satanic type music. Basically rap music. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> basically. But they, yeah. there's a lot of cool rap music with Christian yeah. artists. And it's gotten to a new level now where it's actually really good music, where before, when I was growing up, it was always cheesy to yeah. me, you know what I mean? And so, really, we're building this 360 vision of what a new network looks like. You know, the America Happens Network, americahappens.com. And that's what we've been busy doing. I do the Blood Money podcast where we explore topics of conspiracy. I've been on it before. Yeah, you've been on it. Conspiracy, oh. controversy, and corruption, you know. And you you would fall into some of those categories because you're often talking about those topics, mm -hmm. even though you do it, do it in a very humorous way. I mean, style. I'm just asking questions. Yeah, uh, exactly. Not, yeah. yeah, but you're asking questions having to do with digging in and finding yeah. out the truth to stuff. So Go that a little bit deeper. Yeah, deeper, yeah. So that would qualify for something that, you know, would be blood money worth and, you know, then, you know, a lot of documentaries. We just launched a documentary called uh, Bundy versus Deep State. Mm -hmm. That was uh, released on September 10th of this year. Uh, my business partner, Mindy Robinson, did the amazing Route 91 documentary, which was about the Las Vegas mass shooting and the cover-up behind it, which is crazy because until today it's being talked about. Ron DeSantis about a month ago said, you know, they haven't really figured out what happened at that Mandalay Bay shooting. And that's because people like Mindy, on their cell phones, like literally on her cell phone, she made a whole documentary. And that blew me away, by the way. That was like, you're going to be my business partner yeah. because... I came from Hollywood where unless they have teams of people, they can't get stuff done. Oh, it absolutely. costs hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to hear that this, you know, petite, pretty girl, like on her cell phone, just did this documentary that's gotten, by the way, 100 million downloads already because she let everybody rip it so they could put it on their sites and stuff. So anyway, I, we, filled, we, we formed this amazing team and um, we've just been producing content that exposes the stuff the mainstream media won't, basically. You know, that's yeah. the gist of it. You're doing a lot of hard work. Yeah, yes, yeah. So you were at one point liberal, and then you turn yeah. the page. You had a turning point in your life, some would say. Yeah, between 2015 and 2018 was my arc. Yeah. I started to get interested in Donald Trump. You know, it's not even a liberal Republican Democrat thing. I consider myself more of a libertarian, yeah. honestly. Okay. But um, what it is more about is the constitutional values. Like, I'm a staunch First Amendment Second Amendment, our entire Constitution, but definitely the first and second in yeah. terms of freedom of speech, freedom of press, and definitely right to carry arms. Under, you know, like without any other yeah. things. Like now it's not like not foreshadowing right, anything, but and also like now it's like right to carry arms. But if you're in California, blah yeah. blah blah, you're exactly. you're you're infringed upon, and yeah. it says it shall not be infringed. Like period. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So that was a big thing for me. I mean, because I see. 
where that leads, what kind of tyranny that mm -hmm. leads. I think being of Armenian descent, my parents, and having grown up in California, you know, I could see where this is all going. I know what the bad guys are up to, especially with our background. You know, the, our people have been through a lot of crazy yeah. things in terms of the attacks on Christianity, straight up genocide against Christians, what happened in the early 1900s to the Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians, all great Christians were erased from that area, right? So everybody in America is looking at America, oh my God, they're attacking Christianity, not thinking that this is not a 2016 issue. This is an issue that started 150 years ago. If you look at the world map as a whole, what you see is this wave of, a lot of time, Islam sweeping through in, like most of Asia, going into Eastern Europe, and then pretty much now, like even up to England, it's like the religion's been lost. It's yeah. become almost like an atheistic society. Mm -hmm. And that really started to bother me, that kind of stuff, yeah. because I'm a, even though I could have a foul mouth sometimes, I am a, I, I try to walk in the footsteps of Christ. That's yeah. very important for me, mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. And before we get into what happened on October 12th, mm -hmm. that wasn't your first event. You have been to no. a lot of events. Yeah. I've saw you many events before. Take us down where you started going to events and then some of the ones that you've been to to highlight a few. By the way, the first time I met Donald Trump was in two, uh, 1998. Okay. It was 1998 at a movie premiere and I spoke with him there. And then uh, we had, uh, you know, ran into each other because he was actually building the interior of his plane at a place in Ronkonkoma, mm -hmm. uh, Long Island because he had just bought this new 747, they were doing interior design. And, and so I had interactions with him prior, and you know, it was just kind of casual interactions, yeah. but he'll remember that premiere he was, he'll, he'll acknowledge that, hey, that's where I got my plane made, I know the name of the guy, I know the interior design that they did, because I was shooting a TV show with that guy at that time, you know, that I was producing as well, called Superfly, Pimp My Plane, basically, you mm -hmm. know? And so um, I started going to events really starting in like 2020. I okay. started going to a COVID. lot of events. Yeah. And, um, and at that time, you know, getting familiar with the Republican Party, becoming a little bit more, I guess, an insider, you could say. I was invited and, and becoming a Trump team member for mm -hmm. his uh, 24 election, there was private events where there was really only 200 people there and like we're this far from the former president, you know, mm -hmm. so I've been in close contact with him, his sons, t spoken with Eric, spoken with Don Jr., uh, pretty much all the people that are around him had some form of conversation and like, you know, basically building relationships because I, yeah. I became very passionate about his work because he was a protector of the constitution and he was about we the people and i started to realize that there's him and then there's this elite that are not necessarily interested in going back to the core of our constitution mm -hmm. and i studied law too at that same time so i've been seeing how law has been used to infringe upon our rights mm -hmm. through these legal societies a lot of different elements, you know, at play in terms of what really made me become ever more passionate. And I don't think he's a perfect person by any means. Not, no, no man, man is. Like, nobody's Jesus Christ on this earth, yeah. you know. But uh, I certainly, in comparison to what's out there, I think uh, I think the man's brilliant. I think the his courage is, like, unparalleled. Yeah, you know? and just the way that he keeps going. He hasn't taken an off day mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. I think it's 54 days is the last time yeah. he had a day off. Yeah. He runs on four hours of sleep a night. I, yeah. I genuinely don't think anyone could do it. Yeah. Last night, being in Georgia, driving back home for four hours, dry, or then flying to Vegas, I'm dead. Mm. I, I can barely, I, I don't know how he does it. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's I, a unique, there's unique personalities like that that just have the fighter yeah, in them, and I could, I could, him. I could relate to that. I mean, especially going through this kind of stuff that we're about to talk about. Yeah, I could relate to that because there are certain people that cower and get, they get scared, and there are certain people that once you step up to them, they just step up stronger. Yeah, that's just their instinct. He's built for it. Yeah, he's built for the fight. Exactly. So you've been to a lot of conferences, events throughout, we'll just say, after Obama and then really starting in 2020, mm -hmm. we get to October 12th. Yeah. Take us through that day. Did sure. you start here? Were you in No, no, I should Las take you Vegas? back to Las Vegas. Yeah. I should take you back to that start because that's beginning. where it started. Yeah. So we do a lot of documentaries. I'll take you even back a little further than okay. that because there's some important things to kind of 
talk about, you know. So I started doing a documentary called Bundy versus Deep State in May. I start filming it. And the main character of Bundy versus Deep State, which is a gentleman by the name of Mike Little, who has this amazing lawsuit he's been researching for nine years, has figured out through how through the courts we're going to get our rights back. He figured out how the government's committing fraud, how they're stealing land in our states. And he had this amazing master plan. Mm -hmm. And he was, I was documenting this lawsuit and Mike Little. And then Mike Little, two days before the lawsuit, and this is in June, he falls deathly ill. And within five and a half weeks, I believe it was June, July, five and a half weeks, he dies. And all of us around him are like, this is some shady stuff because he seems as though like almost one of Putin's victims where he might have got poison, he might have got something happened. That, and they didn't have a diagnosis for him, by the way. He died undiagnosed illness. Wow. And they tagged COVID on it. And I saw all of it. That's all mm -hmm. in the documentary, Bundy, Bundy versus Deep State. It's on the America Happens website in the featured section, easy to find. And so that happens. And August 24, he dies. September 10, I released the documentary. And it does pretty well, gets a lot of views and people are talking about it, right? But it's Bundy versus Deep State. Then, right prior to this rally, I get uh, whistleblowers coming forward that are truckers telling me about 150 semi-trailers in Tacoma, Washington, right by a port that are filled with ballots. And by the way, there's a, because there's a port there, there's a crane that looks like it's actually been moving ballots from the big ships there into the semis. And reports that are coming are like unauthorized individuals there. The truckers are being told they're being surveilled the whole time. The truckers are being told to shut up and not talk about what's been going on with the ballot movement. They're told that you gotta go to specific drops, dr uh, truck stops. You can't even piss where you want to yeah. because you gotta go to these specific truck stops. And so I start conducting surveillance and doing all these whistleblower interviews, collecting evidence, and doing the surveillance at these truck stops. Especially, and they're told, by the way, they got to all huddle together with their trucks. They can't even have their trucks parked separately. So it's a very organized, shady operation involving people that are not authorized. And the reason this freaked us out is because most of the ballots for the West Coast, uh, and starting from, or the second, you know, the ha I guess the Western half of the United States are supposed to come from a place called Rayburn. It's a printing house in Arizona, but yet 1,500 miles northwest, all these ballots are being moved through California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. I tell people that I'm doing this, and Patrick Burns, one of the people I got involved, and he actually started talking about this a few days ago, that's why I'm even mentioning this, mm -hmm. because he, ex he exposed it. I'm not really giving any other details other than what he's already exposed. Okay. But the gist of it is that you know, I do surveillance at these truck stops. It's one trucking company, and the trucking company is run and owned by individuals that have a criminal past, yet they've done no time. They've only paid fines for things like rape, right? So all of a sudden, all that stuff looks, starts looking very shady. The individuals I'm talking about that are Patrick Burns investigation team, whose names I can't say, are like, dude, that seems like somebody that is on the hook for the bad guys, and that's why they're using this space, because essentially the owners are forced into yeah. doing this crimes, essentially federal crimes, treasonous crimes, I guess you could say, you know? And so October 11, I take this pile of evidence that I've gathered, recordings, pictures, um, landing slips, bills of landing, and I give it to Patrick Byrne, October 11. And then October 12, this incident happens where going into essentially a parking lot, not even the Trump rally. That's the part where everybody says, ooh, you went into a Trump rally, or you're trying to go into a Trump rally mm -hmm. with, a, with, with guns. And that's categorically untrue because these Trump rallies, the parking lot and the actual rally location are two very yeah. separate locations, separated by usually about half a mile, sometimes a quarter mile, sometimes up to a mile. And the reason they do that is because somebody could drive in with their car, filled with explosives, Timothy McVeigh style, and they could still achieve an assassination. It's not just by bullet, right? So right. because I know these facts, like, and, I, and I'm familiar, so mm -hmm. it's kind of like knowledge is very important, you know, but a lot of people don't have that knowledge. They kind of look at it very black and white. To me, it's like I'm going to this Trump rally after doing surveillance. I leave Nevada. I go do surveillance on, at the truck stops. Obviously, I have my guns with me because I'm putting myself in very dangerous situations at these truck stops. I'm going, you know, my 
unless you have a semi, you stick out like a sore thumb. Oh, yeah. So I'm like in this SUV that is like, like dwarfed compared to those semis. Mm -hmm. And I have video of this too, by the way. Eventually okay. I'll show this. The reason I haven't shown it because the brand of the truck and the company, we haven't exposed yet, if you notice. I didn't talk about yeah. who owns the company. There's a specific brand of a company that was hired to do the trucking, right? Okay. And so I'm there in my you know, SUV filming with my camera, getting like numbers and ser you know, serials and not trying to get caught and stuff. So in that situation, I felt like it was very important to have my firearms just in case. And these truck stops are in the middle of nowhere, yeah. right? It's, it could be a situation where they just come after you and you need, you need your firearms, yeah. you know? So I have these firearms in my truck and I do actually think to myself, cause should I leave it in LA somewhere? Because LA is where I was ultimately, after I did the surveillance, LA is where I was ultimately staying, right? But that just seemed like a bad idea to not have my firearms with me. So when I get these Coachella passes for the Trump rally, mm -hmm. I think, okay, these are lawful firearms, and I don't think twice about it. I'm just like, it's in my back of my SUV in an appropriate spot in the trunk of the SUV. So I'm just like, I'm going to drive out there with them, and I'm going to park my car when I get to this rally, and then I'm going to walk half a mile to get to the rally, which has tons of security anyways. Mm -hmm. And these, these firearms was once a shotgun like this big, mm -hmm. you know, the other ones like a Glock, which is a, it's a, it's a bulky uh, handgun. Yeah. It's not like a 22 or some of these one shooters. Like I've seen dudes with belt buckles that have like a one shooter in there. Yeah. It's not one of those. It's like they're bulky guns, right? right? right. So to me, this is so like innocuous that I don't even think much of it, right? Mm -hmm. Another practice that I have is that whenever I go to these Nevada rallies, I, well, if I see officers, I'll tell them, look, I got my firearms in the back. And just as a courtesy, common right, courtesy, right. and that mm -hmm. I, I learned to be nicer to police, I guess you could say, because mm -hmm. I grew up in LA and I hated the police there, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. These guys were kind of cool because they're not, it's the culture's different, you know what You're I mean? You're talking about Las Vegas Las police. Vegas and Nevada are like, you know, a lot of them are very kind of more intelligent, I would say, and I, knew, and I started to realize this when I was knocking on doors and, you know, cops would run out and ask me questions about like, you know, freedom of speech, especially Second Amendment, things they were concerned about. So I started forming relationships, and as a matter of practice, maybe at 10 different occasions, I told the police here, before entering a parking structure that's half a mile from a Trump, ra a Trump rally, or like quarter mile from a Trump rally, that, hey, I got my firearms. And the guys here, most of the time, they just, or all the time, in my experiences, tell you, thank you for the courtesy. Right. Obviously, don't take it down with you. We don't really care. Yeah. So when I pull up to this rally at Coachella, Prior to entering the parking lot, now the parking, the entrance of the parking lot is like in front of me, I'd say probably, you know, like 20, 30 yards, right? Okay. I see a cop on the side wearing a sheriff's vest and I, and I roll up to him. And by the way, I recorded this and it's weird that I even recorded it. It's kind of like this journalistic instinct, I would say, where sometimes I'll turn the recorder on this little handheld it recorder that I have. It's just audio. Okay. And so, sometimes I'll just turn it on as something. It's just this weird kind of instinct yeah. that comes over me. And it's always served me well to follow my instincts. I almost feel like that's kind of like God poking at you and yeah. saying like, you know. So I start recording, roll up to the police officer, call him in, and you can actually hear in the audio he's coming closer to me, which mm -hmm. by the way is pinned to my profile, this audio for anybody that wants to listen to on it. On X. On X. At, at not Van Miller, Miller at not Jinx. Miller. Yeah, okay. and, it, and, it, and actually it's a video, it's a 17 minute video, one minute of this audio, but 17 minutes that basically blows the false news narrative that Sheriff Bianco yeah. pushed. Blows it away. Anybody that watches is like, dude, there's no way. Like the people that know me, by the way, all were like, there's no way. They, they start yeah. calling me. They're like, dude, I know you didn't do this. What the hell's going on? They're dude, setting you I, up. I was <laughs> you know? wanting to call you as soon as I saw it. Yeah. But then I was like, they may have your phone. You know, people immediately thought, people that are friends of mine that are active in this movement knew that I was working. I just launched a Bundy versus Deep State documentary that mm -hmm. blows away the fraud of the federal government. So the messages I got from the people that we know is, dude, you're, you're being set yeah. up, bro. They're like, you're, they're, they're freaking Lee Harvey Oswalding you because <laughs> they think that like, you know, you're doing stuff that's damaging to yeah. their corruption, which is yeah. exactly what we do and we love it. You know what yeah. I mean? That's like, you know, the most exciting thing to me, so much right. more so than creating some kind of sh reality show yeah. and these kind of disposable entertainment. So I love doing that yeah. stuff, you know? So, so anyway, go ahead. I was gonna say, so you're at the Coachella rally, you pull up, 
And I'm not at the Coachella rally. That's it. So I, I want to create that lot. distinction you're because at, sorry, you're in the parking. No, lot. I'm I'm driving up to the parking lot. Twenty yards in front of me is the parking lot. I see the sheriff right there. And they're I roll to your up car. to him. Okay. I, no, he doesn't even come to my car. I roll up to him, and you hear me saying, "Hey, officer!" And you can hear him getting closer to me because okay. he was like about ten feet away. He comes closer to me, and as he's talking, you could say, "Hear the audio," because it's just audio. It gets closer, closer, closer. And then I say, how you doing, officer? You know, just want to be up front with you. I'm with uh, the Nevada Republican Party. I'm a team member in the Nevada Re Republican Party. And uh, I just want to be up front with you that I have a couple of firearms in the back. And he says, you know, what kind of firearms? I tell him what kind of firearms I have in the back. Is that and normal? Huh? Have they asked that before? Previously? They've never asked that before. Already okay. I knew that so, it was a little bit off. Yeah. So then I tell him, like, dude, you know what? I'm totally cool with you taking him. Oh, I show him my pass. He acknowledges the pass, and I'm like, I'm, I'm totally you cool with you. showed him the pass on your phone? On my phone, yeah. Okay. I say, uh, you know, I'm totally cool with you, like, even keeping these, like, and I could come pick him up later. And then okay. he says, well, we'll decide what we're going to do. Just pull over here. And so I pull over. It's basically, like, the cops here, my car, and I just kind of make a little left into this dead end, and I just pull over. And then another cop comes and tells me to get out of the car and, you know, Soon after, I'm basically, he, he asked me a couple of questions. Soon after, he basically puts me under arrest. They take me into a steaming hot uh, sheriff's or cop's car, and they basically have me sit inside. And at the same time, when I arrived, I wasn't feeling well. My blood sugar and my heart rate, everything was messed up mm -hmm. because, you know, I just generally was not feeling well that day. And I have this bottle of water that has some supplements in there that help to regulate my, you know, blood sugar, heart rate. And um, I ask for that, and they don't give it to me, you know. Uh, they stick me in the sauna hot car, which I was in for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, they think that there's something in my water, kind of insinuating that there might be cyanide in there, that if I drink it, they're like, well, we don't know what's in your water. I'm like, dude, it's just my supplements. Yeah. I feel like crap, please. And I'm begging them. And this, the security, their body cameras will show this, that I was like, basically being medically tortured, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, eventually they bring me a bottle of water that one of the cops, other cops, and he seemed like a kinder person, was basically put it in my mouth and just let me drink it, but not my water, which kind of yeah. helped with the dehydration I was experiencing. But uh, I think two and a half hours in, they finally let me drink my water. So at this point, you were detained. Did, yeah, they, did they say that you were arrested? in the time that you were in the Somewhere car? Somewhere in there, and I was very, like, increasingly unwell, especially with being put in the back of this sauna. They did turn it on, by the way, the, the air conditioning after hour, hour and a half, right? Uh -huh. So somewhere in there this guy reads me the miranda rights okay. but i think actually oh i remember what happened so he asks me straight up lies to me and this was the deputy who was okay. really involved in this situation that doesn't get much mention his name's detective coronado he comes in he lies to me he says dude you know it's totally okay for you to have guns we just want to make sure they're lawful do you mind if we get your serial numbers so i say sure you could go in my car I tell him where the guns are. He's like, you, you could retrieve, retrieve the serial numbers, thinking that he's just going to look at the serial numbers, yeah. and then they're going to let me go. No. What they do is they tear up my car and tear it up like everything was neatly organized in these kind of cases you guys got with the cameras, mm -hmm. my luggage. I have two camera cases, and I have one with, like, basically books, legal documents, because I'm also an avid, I study law all the time. You know, I've, uh, I've, done, I've been doing that for years. So I have all that stuff, and uh, they start tearing everything apart, you know, looking at, like, bomb-sniffing dogs. I'm talking, like, 10, 15 agents just ripping everything inside there. They didn't rip seats and stuff, but they definitely uh, left everything in disarray yeah. as they're looking for something, you know? Uh -huh. They swap-test the muffler. They swap-test the under the hood. And they're looking for something. They're like... It sounds like they're, they were searching for a bomb. Yeah, they're searching 100% yeah. for a bomb, yeah. But they didn't find anything. And then the dude comes up to me, reads my Miranda rights anyways, uh, tells me they're taking me to jail anyways, right? Somewhere in here, he tells me that the Secret Service and the feds want to in interrogate you. And... I'm looking forward to that at yeah. this point because yeah. I'm like, these guys will have some brain cells because these, the, the cops that were doing this, Detective Coronado was like, I'm just like, these guys are out of their mind because this, like, this does not warrant what they're doing. It's so crazy. And I'm like, I got special passes. If you Google me, it's very clear that, 
I'm all over the Republican Party. I ran for office. If you look at my social media, it's like pictures with like every Republican out yeah. there. Um, and I'm like, okay, the feds and the Secret Service will be smarter than these small town cops because it very much felt like Roscoe P. Coltrane type of vibe versus the Dukes of Hazard. Dukes reference. of Hazard, yeah, for us old timers, you know. And um, then he, I have, by the way, I have to go to the bathroom. He, they didn't let me for three and a half hours, which is its own crazy suffering because yeah. I had to hold, like I arrived there having to go and I had to hold it for that long while I'm going through this medical thing. Eventually, they, the detective Coronado takes me to an RV where all the secret service and the feds are stationed. I'm sitting in the back, still handcuffed, you know, hands like this, very uncomfortable, by the way, because mm -hmm. These seats aren't, you know, like right now, if you do this right now and imagine yeah. the seats are bucket seats with plastic. Oh, and it's like that, you know, my wrists still bother me till mm -hmm. now because of the way they did that whole thing. And so they, he takes me to this RV uh, where the Secret Service and feds are stationed. And uh, he tells me they're going to interrogate you here. He gets out of the car. I'm looking at it through the mesh in the back, that little prison looking mesh mm -hmm. thing. And I see him talking to these like five or six agents, mixture of feds and secret service. Uh, and I could tell from the look on their face that like, they're kind of like not very interested in what this guy's pitching. And this guy's really kind of pushing the yeah. issue with them. Definitely agenda driven. And by the way, one thing I forgot is he made a comment about maggots and stupid Trump people that I overheard when I was by the car. This was earlier on okay. to a female officer. OK, and the interesting thing about that is once we retrieved the recording, because I had left the recorder in there, there was female officers that were doing unlawful things. And my lawyer who heard the recording felt that they needed to be added to the defendants list. So most likely the female officer that he was talking crap to about maggots and stupid Trump people was also doing unlawful things inside the car so much so that my attorney felt it was necessary to add these two female officers and agents as defendants. So we're going to find out what that leads to, yeah. by the way, right? Long and short, I'm at this Secret Service station with this uh, officer. They, he basically comes back in the car and says, well, they're going to interview you at the police station. Okay. They didn't want to interview me there, which is odd because, yeah. you know, assassin, whatever, like you think they'd want to, you know. He takes me to the police station. He chains me to a bench. And by the way, until this point, I've asked him multiple times I need to get my one phone call because that's your lawful right. Yeah. Now I'm sitting in this holding area with about a six foot tall piece of glass that separates the holding area from the police officers at their stations. And on the wall, it says, you're right, so I think it's a penal code 258 or something where it says, uh, upon request, they got to give me my phone call. Mm -hmm. So I ask him, they ignore me. He, that Coronado ignores yeah. me. At this point, I'm like, B because they gave me my water prior to uh, the Secret Service non-meeting that happened at the rally, I'm feeling better now. I'm feeling better. I got my supplements in there, you know, mm -hmm. and savage mode starts coming out. And when I say savage mode, like all the legal stuff I know, because I know how to do the legal talk in terms of what these guys are doing when they're violating somebody's rights, right? So I start speaking about, you know, you guys are operating under the color of law. You're not even giving me my, my one phone call. It says right over here that upon request, I'm supposed to, and I start reading the penal code. Off the wall. Dude, the guy's like sitting there on his cell phone playing with his cell phone. He ignores me, the Coronado. Like absolute, just like lawless police officer. And mm -hmm. this is the right-hand guy to the sheriff, Sheriff Bianco. They don't allow my phone call, and then 25, 30 minutes in to the, me being at the station, a Fed and a Secret Service agent walk in. They go to a private room in the corner, and 25 minutes later, they come out, 20, 25 minutes later, and they walk up to me, and the Fed Secret Service agents say, do you mind if we ask you some questions? I say, sure, I would love for you to ask me some questions. I'm like, but... Let's do this. I haven't gotten my one phone call. So why don't I make my one phone call to my lawyer and I'm going to tell him the story. And rather than telling this painful and traumatic story twice, I'm giving you the right to sit right next to me and hear the whole thing. And then after I'm done, you could ask me any question you want. Savage mode activated. Savage mode activated, dude. And these guys are like, okay. Uh, they're like, thank you, sir. And they'd walk away. <laughs> so they, they walk, didn't accept the offer. They walk away and then... 
10 minutes later, this Detective Coronado comes out all downtrodden looking. I'm like, bro, what happened? You know, I'm like, aren't they going to question me? Yeah. He's like, no, they decided not to question you. I'm like, what do you mean they decided? I was bummed out because yeah. I'm like, these smarter agents might save me from this idiot. Yeah. You know? And now I'm kind of like, now I'm going now to jail you're, now you're with this idiot. idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, that was like really scary because I realized this guy's a cowboy. He's not even like, he doesn't care about the law. He's violating my rights left and right. You know, he's physically torturing me by putting on the handcuffs purposefully too hard. You know, chaining me to a bench, my leg, like literally my foot started turning blue because the thing was so pressed on my, the back of my foot. So anyway, I, they, he takes me to jail at this point. They chain my legs. I'm walking in there like a prisoner, you know, very weird feeling. And savage mode is on. They take me to a medical room. They want to start poking me with stuff and taking my blood pressure. I'm like, no consent, no consent, no consent. I get mm -hmm. into, because I know once you say no consent, yeah. if they force you to do some stuff, it's just like, you could come back at them so hard, right? This nurse is trying to force me by like, being like, oh, we're just gonna do this. I'm just, no consent, no consent. I don't care, I don't care what you want. Hot blood pressure, no, no consent, you know? Pretty much shut it down. So after that, they take me inside. They check me in, I get my mug shots taken, then they tell me, oh, mug shots and fingerprints, then they tell me to stand up on this thing. It looks like just a kind of raised off the ground, kind of like, almost like a cube. And once I'm standing and I hear this zzz sound, and I'm like, what just happened? They're like, we took your x-ray. And it was like, they didn't even ask me. I thought I was like, I, you know, I'm like, why, why am I standing on here? And whatever, they did, two seconds later, they took my x-ray. They throw me inside the jail cell. There's a phone in there. I try to call two people and the phone doesn't work. I buzz this thing on the wall that's like this kind of intercom mm -hmm. thing where you're, you know, it's the front Calls desk. An officer. Yeah. And I, to call an officer so I can get my one phone call, they don't even respond. They bring some MS-13 looking guy across from me and this guy is like tattoos and like starts shadow boxing, takes off his shirt, starts working out and I'm like, all right, so I actually started, like, you're in a, like, this concrete room, and I've never, like, been in that kind of a situation. I'm dying to have a pen and a notepad so I could do something productive. It's mm -hmm. just weird. It's like, imagine you're all of a sudden unplugged from all your creative tools as yeah. a creative person. It's actually quite traumatic and torturous, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. So I start working out so I could keep my mind occupied. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, and I'm like, dude, I could get like pretty yoked if this was, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I know why these guys are yoked because there's not much else to do. You yeah. know what I mean? In prison, you know? So then they bring this super mentally ill crazy person two doors down from me. And this guy's literally yelling at the top of his lungs and kicking the walls. How kicking, long were you in there? The 8.30 to 1.15 a.m. 8.30 p.m. to 1.15 a.m. So like I'd say three, like four and a half hours, four and uh, maybe five, you oh, know. Uh. So anyway, eventually they take me out of the cell. They give me a ticket. There was no $5,000 bail. That was a complete lie that people still think I paid bail. I didn't who, pay bail. Who made that up? Who said that? Man, everything was made up. That's the crazy thing. Everything was. We'll get they to said, all the lies. They said fake passports. There yeah. was no fake passports. They said multiple passports. All I got is a Canadian and U.S. passport. The reason I have a Canadian is come I'm born in Toronto. U.S. because I grew up in California. Mm -hmm. And I have both of these IDs with me. And I have only one driver's license, nothing else. But they made it sound like first it was five fake passports, uh, multiple fake driver's license. Fake None of it was passes, fake. You know, yeah. they were like fake license. They didn't even give me a ticket. There's actually a fine for having no license plate, which is $199. All misdemeanors, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't give me a ticket for none of that. They gave me a ticket for having a gun that had 14 bullets, the Glock, instead of 10 bullets, which is the cap in California. So an extended magazine. And they call that a, they call that a high capacity mag in yeah. California. They make it sound like it's a machine gun or an AR or something. Uh, I mean, in California, that's probably the closest thing they have to a to a what to a machine gun. To, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So I mean, to them, under democratic leadership, that's what you get. Yeah. But, and, then, and then the other thing I got ticketed for is I had my mag in the gun. And not out of it. In California, here it doesn't, like yeah. Nevada, it's like all good. It's logical because the, the bad guys have it in the, you know what I mean? They have the bullet in the chamber. Yeah. But in California, you have to have them separate. So these yeah. were tickets. And when I researched what this was, at worst case, this should have been like they gave me a ticket 
and I went away. That on was site, it. too. I mean, yeah. that's something I feel like should be changed is people that travel and they go from state to state, they have to know the laws mm -hmm. because in one state, it's no. completely fine. And then as soon as you cross mm -hmm. over into another territory, yeah. suddenly you're, you're committing a crime. It's hard to keep track and yeah. know your rights. You know, there's principles in law about that. Like when you travel overseas, they're supposed to uh, respect the yeah, laws of where you're from. Exactly. But in our states, I mean, it's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. Like people, you know, you, people don't think that. Like some places you could have it in the trunk. Some places you could have it in the driver's seat. You know what I mean? I always play it safe in mm -hmm. having it in the trunk. But, you know, it so, is what it is. Online, I was reading, and there's two main questions that everyone's wanting to ask you. Yeah. So I want to ask you. Go for it. Rock and roll. <laughs> number one, why did you bring guns to California knowing how strict California is with guns? So I got to be honest. I didn't know about how, how they're that strict. I really didn't. You know, and, mm -hmm. and strictness meaning the two things I was wrong about is four extra bullets in the Glock mm -hmm. and the mag loaded, which I could have easily taken out. Four of the bullets had I really looked at the laws. I mean, it's not that hard to take out four bullets out of your mag and just make sure you only have 10. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the mag, I could have just taken the mag out. But mm -hmm. I didn't think about it that much because I didn't think something like this would happen. I never thought about that, you know? Yeah. In hindsight, did you, do you think that bringing those guns to a Trump rally would have caused what happened no not at all and, and i didn't bring it to the trump rally that was never in my mind because i'm like i'm parking i'm going based at, off what the news totally says. so um, so the, all that stuff's incorrect mm -hmm. and the audio like shows it's incorrect because right. i'm going into a parking lot which is away from a trump rally and that's by, by virtue of knowing that these are two distinctly separate yeah. locations in fact i talked to a secret service agent today that's very supportive of me and he's like dude he's like that's how security's done he's mm -hmm. like you know, obviously you're not taking the Trump rally. You're going to pass two more perimeters. And both of those perimeters have some kind of security check, especially before you enter the rally where you're going to go through a metal detector and they're going to check you. And honestly, dude, I've gone to Trump rallies where they throw away your little vapey thing. I'm mm -hmm. reaching in my pocket because I got one of these stupid things. They throw <laughs> them away because yeah. they don't want you bringing vapes in there, mm -hmm. you know. So these are heavily secured inner perimeters yeah. to, that, to get in. So... It wasn't even a. It wasn't even a blip on the radar. Do mm -hmm. I? Did I think that this kind of insane calamity could happen? You know, no, no. Yeah. I mean, to me, it was like, okay, I'm in California. They got stupid. I mean, grew up in California. Yeah. So, which, by the way, I didn't own in Cal guns in California. Okay. When I was growing up, I was never into guns. The only reason I bought a gun is after I moved to Nevada and I was doing the Blood Money podcast mm -hmm. where you we expose like a lot of stuff. It. Dude, I got death threats sent to my house, mm -hmm. Scrabble pieces, like dead emails that were just like disgusting things about what they want to do to me. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to some friends that do similar kind of whistleblowing work. Uh, Steve Sanson's one of them, uh, who's been very helpful in this situation. He runs Veterans in Politics as a Marine that's been exposing corruption for many years. And he was like, dude, just get some guns, man, you know? And what I was told is like the best kind of th trio to get is one shotgun, one handgun and an AR. I never mm -hmm. ended up buying the AR because I got You're the shot. You're missing out. Yeah, that's what I've been told, yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know. I don't want anything yeah. to come back to me. For the record, I, Mayor, I do not have an AR. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not in California. Yeah, not in California. <laughs> yeah. And the main question, I'm just going to get down to it. The main question it. everyone asks, on October 12th, did you plan to assassinate the president? No, man, no. I've been, like, supporting this guy. Like, America Happens, the America Happens Network is 95% pro-Trump mm -hmm. Trump content. And the way I quantify that is, or qualify that, is everything at the America Happens Network. So our approach is a biblical approach. Mm -hmm. It's about freedom and liberty. And if you look at the Bible, that's where our law stems from, the good law, because there's a lot of statutory yeah. law and all that stuff that is all about you know, literally persecuting people over mm -hmm. nonsense, victimless crimes. Our law stems from that. And then you have this thing called the Magna Carta. Then you have the U.S. Constitution. So because of his support of those, that kind of a biblical law, which is where the con how the Constitution yeah. was written, how it's, what it stems from, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think he's the only candidate for the last, I mean, certainly eight years 
that could save us from this tyrannical mess that we're in. Absolute tyrannical, divisive mess that we're in. And this insanity with sexualization of kids, uh, you know, taking our rights away, misinformation, mm -hmm. censorship of speech. You have Kamala Harris hanging out with the UK tyrant over there, their prime minister, talking about how they got to kill Twitter. Yeah. Like, dude, it's just... It's scary. I am 100%. I don't agree with everything Trump says, mm -hmm. but and like. Anyone that does. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. Because yeah. you have to be Trump to agree with what, you know, you have to be literally. Well, you're not a thinking clone for yourself. Him. I'm yeah. not going to 100% endorse. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll endorse Trump. I'll never 100% agree with anyone. Very if you 100% agree with anyone other than Jesus, mm -hmm. then you're not thinking for yourself. You're kind of faking it. You're kind of, yeah. you, you might lack some personality, uh, you know? <laughs> I'll be the first to say Trump has done stuff that I personally disagree with. Yeah. Some policies that he may support, I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. But the big picture mm -hmm. is who is the lesser of two evils? Who is the one fighting for censorship? Who is the one wanting to raise your taxes? Who was in charge for, of the border for four years yeah, and yeah, did yeah. absolutely nothing? Man, and I just saw the James O'Keefe film. He actually showed me a rough cut like a month and a half mm -hmm. before. Masterpiece. But when you see what this administration has done at the border, where there's 300,000 plus missing children, okay? And some of them are delivered straight up to criminals' homes, rapists, sexual abusers, and then they disappear. Mm -hmm. Like what is happening is the pinnacle of evil. Like it's literally the antithesis of what the Bible is. These, this is. So in terms of wanting to harm anything with Trump, I mean, he's one of the few people that actually jump in front of if he's getting shot at. And believe me, there's not many because yeah. I feel like with my skill sets, we're doing something valuable. There's not many people like us, almost like this, you know, cause I'm like, I do the James O'Keefe stuff, but I also direct, produce, edit myself like One Man Bandit. Uh, or sometimes collaborate with my business partner, Mindy. So I see value in what, what I'm doing as a human mm -hmm. being, but like to save that man's life, I would actually do that. So, I mean, anything to, to do with harming him, in fact, I've been defending him. I basically left Hollywood because I couldn't stand what they were doing with like the Frankenbiting and the, and the lies and the fake news. It just disgusted me. And I had to choose a side because it was starting to become very clear that this is like a battle between like good and evil yeah. on a biblical level. And that's what level. it comes down to. Yeah. You have someone that said to all Christians, you're at the wrong rally. And then the funny thing, you saw her at the church, right? Mm -hmm. The next day she went to a church and I saw something online and that church ended up being one of the only churches that Worship openly, <laughs> <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. But they, they supported abortion and LGBTQ rights. Yeah. So very ironic that she chose that church to do a photo op in. Mm -hmm. but and by I'd the way, when you watch James O'Keefe film, have you seen that movie? I've not. Dude, a lot of the most evil stuff is coming out of churches. They're straight up demonic individuals running these churches and what they're doing is horrendous. Like like with these border crisis, with like children going missing, with robbing people like for their, of their money. It's just the church, unfortunately, the church is within me. Let me put it that way. I don't know if right well, now there's many churches that I feel as though they truly do represent the voice of Christ. Where we would disagree is I wouldn't call them a church. Mm. The ones that are supporting abortions, yeah, the yeah. ones that are yeah. openly LGBTQ and, and allowing, the ones that are, are open to all religions, they call themselves universalist churches. Mm -hmm. Those are not Christian churches. No, not, and I think no. there's, an, there's an important um, divide between the two. Just because it claims it's a church, yeah. you, you can call yourself a woman, that doesn't make mm -hmm. you a woman. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes with the church. Yeah. So it's an important distinguishment to be made well, that just because they claim to be a church of God doesn't make them one. Yeah. The one that Kamala did a photo op in, not yeah, a church. Yeah. See, my background is, uh, because I'm of Armenian descent, our church is the Armenian Orthodox Church, which mm -hmm. is as OG as it gets. You're it's Orthodox? Old school. Half Orthodox, half Protestant. Okay. Right? We, I've had experience, lifelong experiences mm -hmm. with both. But the Orthodox guys are like different level. Oh, like, they're traditionalists to, to Christ, the core. Right? Yeah. So by, if you notice, 
one of the only two places that Antifa will never ever go to. You know where they are? I'll tell you the main one. I have a, I'm based off context clues, I'll go with the Orthodox churches being one of them. Well, it's the Glendale community where it's primarily Armenians that run it. Okay. And when Antifa showed up, because we feel so strong about our children and our family values and traditional, they beat the piss out of Antifa. Antifa swore they're never going to go back. The other place was Dearborn, Michigan, with the Muslims over there, the Muslim men. You know because, Hamtramck, Michigan? Huh? Hamtramck, Michigan? What is that? Oh, uh, it's the number one Islamic. Oh. Yeah, I digress. Yeah. I thought they were close. Yeah. Sorry, keep going. No, just the point being that, like, Armenians are very Christian, especially the ones that are of faith, and that you don't mess with their children. You don't no. mess with their families. We've had historical people trying to mess with our children and families. Like, we're all scarred from it. We have generational trauma. And that's why when Antifa went to Glendale, it popped off. There's videos. And the cool thing is I just met a lot of those guys because I did a podcast with some of them a couple of weeks ago. No. And uh, they're in the videos, like, just beating the piss out of these guys. <laughs> I'm like, it's the coolest thing. I'm yeah. like, everybody that I know... Like, all the Republicans were talking about them mm -hmm. because they fantasize w with that kind of thing, but the Armenians got away with it. It's an Armenian community. The judges, the police officers, they got basically connections everywhere. So a lot of those guys didn't, you know, you know, if it was, like, other places, they might have done time in jail yeah. and stuff. But, like, these guys were basically booked in and then let go a few hours ago because the police officers, all of them, they're like, nah, dude, we don't, we're not cool with Antifa. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So... A lot of them almost got a pass for the, those actions. And honestly, I'm proud of them because when they're messing with your children, we can't be, uh, I'm definitely not condoning violence. But mm -hmm. if they're messing with your children, you your have to families, have a you got to have a boundary, man. You yeah. got to have a boundary. It's you, time you, you got to say no. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes saying no, you know, might involve, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, not condoning violence. It's just saying, you know. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll cut the clip there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, man. Well, to go back to October 12th, yeah. how is it, what's your life been like after that? Oh, man, it's that? been crazy, dude. It's been and, crazy. You know, honestly, I've been, I, I've really been thinking, I'll tell you, even when it started, the moment I was put in handcuffs, I knew that Christ was putting me in this position. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew it in my soul at that point, dude. As I'm sitting in that sauna, I knew that this was there's a purpose to this. Yeah. Doesn't mean it makes he it chose easy. You. Doesn't mean it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. But I knew there was a purpose for this. Now certainly the next morning when I woke up after being released from the jail at 1:15 a.m. where you know I went to first I walked for a mile because just to shake off this yeah. traumatic experience. Got an Uber, went to 7-Eleven, tried to get my car. The tow truck yard was closed. Then I'm motel and hotel hopping because everything was booked because of the Coachella rally. Eventually, I end up in this, like... one guy, you weren't even at home. You were still nah, stuck dude. in California. No, no, no. So I, I check into this motel that I best describe, and I'm not trying to be crude, but it's like one of those crappy places with stains all over the sheets, and it's obvious that people go there for two, three hours to have s***. That's what mm -hmm. the place was. And I'm laying there in my bed, and I, and I s*** you not. Like, the next door guy was with a female and they're going at it for four hours like this was a flick and probably was and 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 it's loud banging and i'm just sitting there and thinking like wow this guy like deserves a medal for this like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know what i'm saying like i'm just i was it's weird because even that traumatic moment i'm like kind of having fun within my Ugh. head just trying to anyway so Eventually, I fall asleep at 5 in the morning, wake up two hours later, go to the taco place next door, and look at my cell phone, and I realize that I'm um, this, like, mm -hmm. like, potential Trump assassin, and it's all over the news. Everywhere. 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 And then my phone starts buzzing. Mm -hmm. and Did they ever take your phone? Uh, they did when they, well, I was in jail, and then they gave it back and then to they, me. Right and after like you got released. Plastic bag, okay. yeah. But man, I'm like, okay. And that was like really like a big thing, but there, the purpose of it sunk in. And yeah. I realized that, okay, there's, I'm being put, put in this situation. Mm -hmm. And I went to my room 
and I quickly put together that video where you see me all tired and haggard looking. Mm -hmm. It's an hour and a six, a six minute long video because I saw the reports that were coming from the sheriff. I'm like, this is categorically bullshit. Everything is a lie from top to bottom. And what did he label you as? Like he said stuff like lunatics, sovereign citizen. Um, uh, what else? Like I heard he said, I li oh, I verbally said I am here to kill fill in the blank. Right. His name. But did he say that you were a, he's fix me where I misquote what he said, but on the press conference, he said, um, we believe that we stopped a potential third assassin. Yeah, yeah. We believe we stopped the third Trump assassination attempt. Uh, he said that he was here a hundred percent to cause, uh, like, Harm, I Did think he say hundred percent? No, no. He said, "Yeah, we know he was here to cause harm. We don't know what kind of harm, which is a weird sentence to say." Yeah. I mean, and even the press started the thing going like, started questioning him. They're like, "Wait a minute, he was released on five thousand dollar bail." Everybody was on that story, even though I was released mm -hmm. on no bail. I was given a ticket. You know, which do you want me to show you the ticket by yeah, the way? On the, yeah. so. Before we keep going, I would like to thank the sponsor of this video one more time. Kalshi went to court and won legal approval to bet on the election for the first time in over a hundred years. That is a huge deal. They have markets for who's gonna win the presidential election, who's gonna win the house, who's gonna win the Senate, and even who's gonna win each swing state. So many people are using Kalshi, there's already one billion dollars in exchange worth of trades. So let me give you a quick example. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are right now betting about 50-50. So if you put in $100, you will double your money if your side wins. If you're as confident as I am about Donald Trump winning in just a few weeks, I don't know why you wouldn't put your money in on Kalshi. Let's win easy money. Let's get Donald Trump back in the presidency. And let's take America back. So it's, like, it's funny. I carry it because it's, um, I got to frame this thing. So, so I was given this ticket right here and no bail, no nothing, and I was uh, let go, you know, right there. There you go. On those two misdemeanors, something that you don't even take people in for, throw them in jail, much less call them Trump assassins, right? And so I go in my room and I make that hour, six minute long video, which is still on the America Happens mm -hmm. website, and because I'm seeing this guy, literally Sheriff Bianco, wall-to-wall -wall lies. Mm -hmm. Everything was a lie, right? I put the play-by-play, -play, what really happened, just like I explained it to you right now. And the reason I did that is because that's time-stamped. And I knew when the body cams come out... When are they coming out? Uh, thus far, they've refused to release it. But they have to. They, they haven't. They haven't thus far. Lawfully, and, they have yeah, to. Yeah, they haven't. I mean, this is the, lawful is not what that sheriff does. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's very obvious. And once you watch the clip that I put together, which is pinned to my profile, uh, which I'll get to. But the gist of that is, on October 22nd, there was a county board meeting, and people get to talk for two minutes. Multiple individuals coming forth talking about how this sheriff has committed crimes upon them over and over again. And they're like, this guy needs to go. And they give examples of lawsuits, people dying in custody, bullying, bribes, you name it. When did you learn he was running for governor or plan to run for governor? Once people found out and I start, they're like, dude, there's no way this is you. You're being set up. You just released Bundy versus Biden. You do where you were just chasing ballots. You're being set up. So everybody we know was like on the you're being set up twi mm -hmm. to twist because they knew that I was working on controversial topics in terms of the yeah. government. That I had released a controversial doc documentary, that I was chasing these ballots, handing it to like Patrick Byrne, you know, the most likely fraudulent ballots in the semis. So everybody was on the tip that you're being set up. So I figured, you know what, the best thing to do right now is put this video together, it's time stamped, and I know the truth that I was seeing on that video would eventually via uh, getting the body cams be confirmed to be true. And I saw, okay, the, I saw God's plan in all of that. Cause I'm going through this like valley of darkness, so to speak, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was a valley of darkness moment, but I could see it from the 30,000 mile view. And it was, it was very weird because even as like in that moment where I should have, a normal person would have broken down and stuff. I was a little emotional, but it wasn't like, I've never, it's never felt overwhelming. You were more weird. pissed than you were emotional. Pissed and like weird calmness, dude. That's what I could say. Weird calmness that is like, 
I, it's not of this earth, mm -hmm. just let me put it that way. I was so calm throughout all of this. I calmly, and you see that video, that video was put together like an hour after I learned about this stuff where I turn, I'm in the crappy motel room, I point the camera at myself and I just tell the whole story. And everything that I said there was 100% the truth, okay? And I also remember I had my recorder in the car, but I don't have my car with me because they towed it away. They, that's one detail I forgot. They towed my car away two and a half hours in, and I didn't get it back until a week later because after I made this video, I actually, I was trying to upload it from the motel. It kept crashing because I'm like, this thing needs to hit the rumble mm -hmm. and the X, and I need to start sharing with yeah. everybody. Wouldn't upload. I left that location in an Uber, traveled the journey about two and a half hours, ended up at another undisclosed location where I felt safe because I was no longer in Riverside. Same clothes on my back, disgusting. I even talk about that in the video where I just felt disgusting because I didn't have my clothes. It was impounded. Now, I was in this undisclosed location about a week later after doing a whole bunch of press and telling my story over and over and over again to whoever would listen because my phone was blowing up. Everybody wanted to talk with me, everyone. And when I say everyone, Man, I mean everyone, bro. Everyone. Like CNN, ABC, NBC, Fox. Like they all wanted to hear my story. And so about a week later, I return to Riverside. And this time everybody knows I'm going there in case something happens. I'm with a driver that's helping me out. I take an Uber back. I go to the police station. I pay ungodly amounts of money at the police station and tow truck yard to get my car back. I exit that tow yard and everything was everywhere. Like my laptop on the floor. Like these guys weren't like, oh, let's put this stuff neatly back. No, it was like everything that was neatly placed was now like all over the car, on the floors, like, you know, uh, water next to my uh, laptop. That's like, you know, water bottle. Mm -hmm. That's like seeped in, like just very destructive, long and short. But my recorder's there. I see my recorder there, but it's out of batteries because it ran out of batteries. It was running the whole time. And I'm like, man, I hope they didn't scrub this. Yeah. But I get the hell out of Riverside. I drive and I go back to another undisclosed location. And once I arrive, I put the batteries in and I realized that the recording was preserved. And I knew then that that was going to destroy them. Because I knew what happened. I knew my version of the story. I knew it wasn't what the sheriff was saying, yeah. that they investigated me, they pulled me over, they found the guns. No, everything was honestly fully declared to him. And this recording shows that. So I'm like, you know what, man? Eventually, this is going to play out yeah. in my favor. And I saw how God protected me throughout all of this. Even I was walking through the darkness, the trauma, yeah. whatever you want to call it. And um, I knew that, like, eventually, you know, it's all going to work out. But the, in the interim, it's been very difficult because mm -hmm. that next day after getting my car back and going to undisclosed location, I go to the store. I go to Target, and people are recognizing me. Some people are scared. Some people are just like, oh, my God, it's that guy. Some people are looking at me like they want to kick my ass. At a gas station people are looking at their phones noticing me you know now at the same time what's happening and this is where we get into the intense corruption and controversy beyond what happened in Coachella is my parents home in Vegas which the police thought that's where I was living even though I have another address because after 2022 when I got started getting death threats my address is not uh, on record sometimes I have mail sent to my parents house and the police thought in Vegas that that's where I'm living. Mm -hmm. And so two officers show up knocking on my parents' door. My parents refuse to open it. Good. They leave a card, then it's a terrorism unit, anti-terrorism unit. And this is significant. This is where what the conspiracy and the craziness goes to another level. The next day, this is October 13th, they show up. And by the way, they have no right to be there because the feds have already exonerated me on October 12th. They knew it was a nothing burger. But then the state police show up under the guise of anti-terrorism going on our private property, my parents' private property. And they're snooping around. My parents don't open. They call this guy, Steve Sanson, who's a badass. He's like one of the individuals that actually has been whistle, you know, helping whistleblowers, exposing corruption. And Steve 
uh, basically calls the police department to find out what's going on. He doesn't get an answer. The next day on the 14th, what I was told is 7 to 12 heavily armed anti-terrorism officers show up to my parents' home again. And again, Steve Sanson gives a, gets a call, but this time he comes to the house. And he asks these cops what they're doing there. And by the way, before he got there, they were trying to get inside the house. They were trying to convince my mom to go inside the house, and she wouldn't let them. And Steve Sanson gets there, says, what are you guys doing here? Do you have a warrant? They say no. Well, he's like, then get the F out of here. That's very yeah. Steve Sanson. That's the way he approaches these guys. Tough guy, Marine, you know, he's like in his 50s, but like, he's just, you know, built like a rock. Every yeah. day he works out, you know? They threaten him, and they say, you're obstructing justice. What do you mean I'm obstructing justice? You don't even have a warrant. So this is where... This is where crazy theories come from, because here, this is the thing. State has nothing to do with assassination mm -hmm. attempts. They claim they're there for a welfare check, which is not what you do with anti-terrorism. No. For people that know the laws, and this is the damage of the Patriot Act, if somebody is deemed under terrorism to be something that has terroristic uh, intentions, you have no due process. They could take you in. In fact, they could kill you, and it won't be investigated like if they just killed somebody like um, in any other situation yeah. because that person's a terrorist. They could keep you in interrogation as long as they want. They could make sure you don't have a lawyer, right? That's the unit that was there. These were not welfare check workers. Steve recognizes this because he knows corrupt cops. He sued the police department before. And he's like, wait a minute, guys. You guys are here because of that Coachella incident, which the feds are saying is done. You know, what the hell mm -hmm. are you guys doing here? You're a state agency. He calls Sheriff McMahill, the sheriff of Clark County. The sheriff McMahill says, I had no knowledge that this was happening over there. I'm out of town. This was not authorized. So it's warrantless and unauthorized. Yeah. Steve hears that these guys are here for an investigation because he's, they say you're obstructing justice. So what are you investigating when this is under the federal purview, not state purview, okay? To us, it started to become very clear that this was a rogue unit of cops. And had I been there, and you've heard many stories like this, I don't think I would be here today wow. because they would have shot me down. They would have shot me down. And how do I qualify that? That's not a conspiracy theory because these guys are rogue. They have no authorization. They have no warrant. They're there claiming they're investigating something under terrorism officers, mm -hmm. which implicates that I'm going to have no due process under that situation because they deem me to be a terrorist. I truly believe that there was a phone call made from Sheriff Bianco after he realized his monolithic screw up and maybe saw the body cam footage, realized that everything he said was a lie. And a very quick way to tie that in a knot is that Vem Miller is at his house. He flinched. We shot him. He's killed now. He's dead. And the news then says, third Trump assassin, gunned down inside his home by anti-terrorism officers. And by the way, he's this crazy right-wing guy that's produced content with all these crazy right-wing guys. You see how that ties yeah. into a nice, neat bow where now everybody I'm associated with, including potentially yourself, yeah. including Ivan Raikland, including Patrick Byrne, including the 250 people I've interviewed that are part of the freedom movement for blood money alone, 600 episodes, mm -hmm. no, 800 episodes we've done, including the Bundys that I just did the documentary for, including Patrick Byrne, who now knows about the ballots, right? So you see how in one felt swoop, they could write the story and we've seen this fake news and literally discredit our entire movement and use that as a way to damage Trump. Sovereign citizen, they, they're, they're saying, which is insane because... I heard that. How could I be a sovereign citizen when I'm running for government office and I'm supporting a government candidate and I'm part of a team member that has gotten Donald Trump probably hundreds of votes mm -hmm. through knocking on doors? Like today I get a text message from my friend's son. He's 21 years old. He tells me that he made all of his friends vote for Trump. He's got a crew of like maybe 20, 30 kids that are between 18 to 22 years old, all that voted Trump, right? So you see how if I was shot down, it's like our part of the movement, the grassroots would all be implicated as a bunch of crazies yeah. 
they would make me out into this right-wing lunatic. Sheriff Bianco was calling me a lunatic. Sheriff Bianco was saying that, and this is why people say, oh, he's a constitutional sheriff, and they take offense with the fact that I'm going after him. What's constitutional about any of his actions? Just because he told Gavin Newsom to F off because of the mass mandate, mm -hmm. he didn't keep businesses open. He didn't do any of that stuff. He went with this theory that there's a Trump captain, which I am, team leader, that is a sovereign citizen, that is a crazy guy with guns and lunatic. That's what the message yeah. he was sending out. And boy, did the mainstream media eat that up. That's mm -hmm. why the thing was blown up, because they were looking for that right-wing Trump guy that's a crazy, gun-carrying, anti-government person. That was a perfect narrative, and they milked it like crazy. Yeah. Which, by the way, once and now the story's settled, they won't even give me the airtime to correct the story on their network. So I've had to go on all these podcasts, small and big, to correct the story. But Fox News and Newsmax, they won't have me on there. But they gave Sheriff uh, Bianco all the airtime in the world. So Steve Sansa, when he explained to me, he's like, listen, dude, I know cops, I've been in this work, they were there to gun you down. They were there to gun you down. You were there, you're either gonna get taken in without any due process and interrogated like crazy, and they're gonna make the process the punishment until you said something that they could use against you, yeah. or they're just gonna gun you down because you flinched and they thought you had a gun. And nobody could say anything mm -hmm. at that point. And so being in hiding actually helped me not to perish in that moment and Lawsuit was filed against them by Sigal Chatta, who is the chairwoman of the Republican Party National. Um, now we're adding the LA, M LA Metropolitan Police Department to this lawsuit, the terrorism unit that unlawfully showed up without a warrant, without authorization from the chief of police over here, Sheriff McMahill. And that's where we are. Now, in terms of the effect this has had on my life, I mean, dude, it is a different life I'm living right now. It's a now. new chapter. Like, you saw me when, you, when, when we met in the lobby. You, how, how was I? I didn't even recognize you. Because I had a face mask on, which yeah. is like absolute torture. The fact I have to wear one of those face diapers, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not wearing the hat I normally wear. I was wearing a beanie, you know? And it's like I'm concealing my identity having to go places to be safe because... Not only do I have people that might have not heard that I'm not the Trump assassin thinking that, you know what, we off this guy, we're doing Trump a favor. That's one of the risks. The other risk is some crazy leftist that is wanting to hurt me because I'm a Trump person. Then there's a third risk. Now I'm going after the police over here, like literally going after the police department, these corrupt cops, you know, all things that were not part of my plan right now. Like, I don't want to go after the cops. I don't want to go after Sheriff Bianco. But when they destroy your reputation internationally, and I'm getting text messages from people I haven't seen in years, some decades, going like, dude, like you're not this guy, bro. Like, well, yeah. what's going on? Are you being set up? And the great thing about this, by the way, is a lot of leftists that I know in Hollywood, who I've been telling them the fake news, the fake news, the fake news, now saw somebody they know, and they despise my politics because I'm not one of their, you know, whatever, liberals or right. leftists. But they're like, whoa, wait a minute, man. This dude that we know is not an assassin. Vem is definitely not an assassin. But they fake newsed him enough where they made him an assassin internationally. And I'm telling you, that's also going to get Trump more votes. That's also going to change hearts and minds because they realize under this current system, with this corruption we have going on, their life could be destroyed, man. If I could be a Trump assassin as like some Hollywood kid that like was making documentaries and reality shows and now is, you know, running the America Happens Network, doing the same thing for the freedom movement. How easy is it for anybody yeah. to be mean that when they write the script, you know? So there's a lot of, um, while my life's become very difficult, like I had to go um, to uh, the other day with a bodyguard to a press conference. Uh, five police cars showed up because now the chief of police is scared that I might get gunned down in this jurisdiction and he doesn't want that in there yeah. in, in, because then that's going to create a lot more problems for them. Five cop cars plus I'm paying a bodyguard to like be there. Um, I'm constantly having to explain to people, imagine there's millions of people that have this impression because they mm -hmm. haven't seen these pieces that we do in our freedom yeah. media, right? Like 
contacting me, cursing me out, wanting to kill me, wanting to cause me harm, hitting my Instagram, hitting, you know, some texting me, some texting my second phone, which is available. Um, some just asking me questions like, are you stupid to go into a Trump rally? And one by one, text message or leaving a voice message, I have to explain to them the story because the mainstream media, wow. like if they were like, all right, fine, we screwed up. Let's put it on blast. Let's put you on prime time and clear up the story. That would be good. But now I'm having to do this almost on an individual level, yeah. trying to convince people like I'm not that person. And the story I just told you, I've had to tell like a thousand times, sometimes more. And explain the geography of the parking lot that, you know what, the parking lot's here, the rally's over here half a mile away. And that was not what I was planning to do with the rest of my life, dude. That's what's crazy about this, that the fake news was so just wrong and repugnant that now it has made this significant difference in my life. But there's God's work right there, by the way, because my mandate has always been to help rebuild the media and make this media 2.0 that's not a propaganda machine. And now I've been put in a situation that like Trump, the fake news had irreparable consequences upon my life. That'll, this'll never repair itself, internet's forever. So I have a mandate now, dude. I have a mandate where yeah. I have to finish this work that we started with the America Happens Network, which is really about media 2.0 that takes us out of this propagandistic fake news bullshit that's destroying our country. And it's destroyed our country for a really long time. Whether it's the lies that led to the Iraq war, whether it's like the lies that led to people taking and not doing, you know, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine that would have saved them rather than taking what many say is a death think it's damaging. It's been a cancer in our country. And talk about cancer. All the natural approaches to curing cancer left out of the media completely. Yeah. They want you to be sick here. You get sick, they sell you stuff, they try to make you live as long as possible on their crap, and then you die. Mm -hmm. Versus healthcare, with real healthcare, which is you take care of yourself. You listen yeah. to what a lot of these frontline doctors say about supplements and taking care of your health and taking things that strengthen your body and all that stuff. So there's a... Um, I see a huge opportunities, man. I see oh, huge yeah, opportunities the, from this, and I feel like I've been put in a situation to, I have to do this now, you know? And the irony of this, by the way, is that three months ago, I told uh, higher-ups at the Republican Party in Nevada that I'm working on bills of how to fund the new media and divert funds from either the Mockingbird media or SBA Opportunity Zone like loans, where people like you and I our networks, our shows get the enough, get enough funding where we could become quickly the mainstream media, knock those guys out within six months. That's all it's going to take if we do this. And then we're looking at a better America, man. We're yeah. looking at a better America. We're not psychologically poisoned. It's not psychological warfare on the people. It's information and entertainment that is fruitful for our country. Absolutely. It just goes to show you never know what God's got in store for you. I mean, I bet a month ago... Yeah, a month ago, you had no clue that this would be your new life's turn. But yeah, we'll yeah, be praying insane. for you. And yeah. I encourage everyone watching, keep them in your prayers. Um, tell everyone where they can go to read everything, read your side, see the documents, see the files. Yeah, so I, we got a lot of it on AmericaHappens.com. We also have, if you go to Not Them Miller, my Twitter, I'm posting so much stuff. And the thing pinned on their 17-minute video blows the sheriff's story out of the water. Just completely blows away. Shows that this guy's basically a lying sociopath because in that press conference, he was saying that we're lucky we didn't have to kill him. And there wasn't even an incident to kill me for. Yeah. Like, it was like, you know, guys, you know, letting you know about my firearms, pull over, I'm handcuffed, I'm put in a police car. I don't resist. All that stuff is evidence. It's on body cams, it's on the recording. And this guy was talking about having me killed. So you realize that the sheriff is a very sick person, a sociopath. He's not the constitutional sheriff that he says he is. And uh, that's all over my social media, not Ben Miller. Uh, America Happens One is another Twitter account we have. And certainly AmericaHappens.com, our website. 
I highly encourage you to at least just watch that 17 minute video. You'll never think that I'm this crazy assassin. That story will be laid to rest. And please watch a lot of the other cool stuff we do, like the Bundy versus Deep State documentary. That's also just everybody loves that one. It's got like 100% favorable rating. Nobody's ever said a bad thing about it because it is such a powerful documentary and it shows really the extent of our corruption, but also how to fix it through lawful methods, through the courts. And, you know, I don't know, we love the work that we do and we're very proud of it. So hopefully Absolutely. like things settle down, I get a semblance of a normal life back. I have to, now I need bodyguards or I need like, you know, to hide my identity. It's like, I hope that kind of goes away and people forget what Ven Miller yeah. looks like because I never wanted to be in front of the camera. I will say this though, I am very proud of a lot of conservatives that they did not buy in to what the initial media headlines were saying. I, I've been shocked yeah, in yeah. a good way with yeah. a lot of the people. Um, it, it goes to show a lot of Trump's messaging and fake news media and not trusting them, you know, really showed here that a lot of people aren't completely blind or deaf to the real story. Yeah. And so I would definitely encourage you guys all Get both sides of the story. Check out America Happens Network. Show some support, and um, I'll keep you updated on my ex, the ongoing battle and um, legal work that Vim has in store. Yeah. I want to thank you guys so much for watching this podcast. This was part one of hopefully many. Let me know in the comments section who you would like to see on um, future guests. It could be anyone. Do you, do you want to see Jason Aldean? I know I, I want to see Jason Aldean on the podcast. I mean, yeah, if you want to make it happen, hey. Or Vegas Matt, Vegas Matt on the podcast. Black Madison on the podcast. We have so many candidates. Uh, so let me know in the comment section down below. Uh, drop a comment and let me know your thoughts on the story of Vim Miller. Do you believe him? Do you think that you just told a story for the last hour? I don't know how long we've been filming, but do you... Hour and 20 minutes, do you think that he just spoke out of his <laughs> <laughs> Let me know in the comments section down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, shout out to my sponsor, Kalshi. You can check them out in the description down below as well. Don't forget to use my code. Get a free $20 in credit using it after you deposit $100. Bet on the election. Hey, put your money where your mouth is. If you believe Trump's got it in the bag, don't just say it. Don't just go vote. Go vote. But hey, put your money where your mouth is. Go on Kalshi.com. Use my code. Love you guys. I'll see you guys next week or whenever the next podcast is. It, it might never happen again. I don't know. But hey, if you want it to happen, show some support. I love you guys. I'll see you guys next week. Peace out.